It's the off season, which means silly season is about to commence. What's the latest on Mitch Marner? Who are your new Hall of Fame inductees? Who are the snubs? We'll answer all of that and get to our daily draft profile for the Maple Leafs. All on today's edition of the Locked On Leafs podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. It's your team every day. Your Locked On Maple Leafs, your daily podcast on the Toronto Maple Leafs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome into the Locked On at Leafs podcast, a daily Maple Leafs centric podcast hosted by myself, Mike DiStefano, and my co-host, Dave Morissuti. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, use the code Locked On NHL for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. What's going on, Dave? How are you feeling on a Wednesday? Well, Canada picked up a big win at the Copa America or Very Peru. Sure. What their first win, uh, like ever at that tournament? Is that what I first ever, first ever win at Copa America? Yeah, because like they qualified for the first time in a long time, too. Yeah, yeah, I and the Jays, Jays won too. So things are looking up. Well, not really, they broke like a seven game losing streak. <laughs> They they avoided being swept for a, another series. This is essentially all, all that happened. Uh, but yes, I mean, good for Canada. The Leafs finally got their uh, the Jays finally got themselves uh, uh, a victory here. The Leafs kind of quiet. Like, isn't it eerily quiet? Like, you've got so much going on around the NHL. You've got all these other teams who've gone out and they've dealt with their goaltending issues. They've traded for for goalies to shore up those positions. You had some trades go down again on, you know, Tuesday. You saw that Jake Wallman deal go through and a couple other trades that were made. And, and you know, you're hearing a lot of news of some other teams that are getting active. Not much coming out from the Maple Leafs uh, in terms of what they're looking to do over the next couple of days like are, are you expecting to hear some news at some point here because it's been pretty quiet i would say uh, uh, for the maple Leafs. i mean outside of fake mitch marner rumors that apparently are being started pretty status quo for what's going on with them i'm in all my years of uh working at sportsnet i always know that most of the stuff doesn't happen until the day before, the night before, or the morning of trade of the NHL draft. Like things start brewing without around this time, but things don't go off until like that just before then. I'm a little surprised that we haven't heard more. Um, cause yeah, considering there's so much to be done. Like I was listening to Frank Cervalli and they're like, like he's expecting Leafs to be kind of active because they just got so much they gotta do. Like, <laughs> yeah. Well, when are they going to get it done? Like there's, there's like no time to do anything now. And it seems like, I, I don't know what's I, obviously they're, they're working behind closed doors and they're getting some yeah. things done. And, you know, we, we heard about the Joseph wall deal. That's pretty much done and tucked in the top dress desk drawer. You know, maybe there's another couple of, you know, desk drawer contracts out there that just haven't been announced or haven't, you know, been leaked out to the media yet or anything. So perhaps there are, there is things that, that, you know, the Leafs are moving and shaking, you know, quietly behind closed doors. But yeah, in terms of like concrete, this is what's going on with the Maple Leafs, you know, not, not a whole lot uh, recently. We never really did get into that Marner trade that like, did you see that nonsense Marner trade that broke over the weekend there? Apparently Marner was going to Utah. The, the first Real, and I know that there, you know, someone in the Discord threw it in there. I think it was, I don't know, Saturday, Sunday, or whatever it was. And right away, like, you look at who it came from, and you're like, who the hell is this guy? Like, just yeah. some random dope on Twitter who's well, not actually random dope. That's the weird part. He actually is, like, an NBA writer for, like, New York Daily News or something like that. So he's, like, an actual writer is, is, is what I'm led to believe based off of his Twitter bio, at least. And all of a sudden, it's like this guy's picking up a scoop on a Mitch Marner trade. Something doesn't smell right. And I think since it has come out that both sides like, yeah, no, not uh, not the case, not happening. But like this thing spread like wildfire. I don't, I don't know if you had a bunch of people message you and ask if it was true, but I know that I did. 
I had a couple people and they're like, do we believe this? And I said, no, we do not believe this. Like no. it did, it took me two seconds. Like, as soon as I, like, I, I saw it first in the discord and I'm like, guys, peep who's like writing this. Like, I understand they have a blue check mark, but sometimes blue check marks are also looking to get some, generate some clicks and generate some views. Oh, you can buy blue check marks now. That's the problem. You can yeah. just straight up buy them with Twitter blue. Like that's that's just a subscription service now. It's not. It doesn't mean anything about reputable like it used to. Yeah, it used to mean a lot when you got a blue check mark. Now, yeah. thanks Elon, it means nothing anymore. I remember I got my blue check. I was so excited. I was so happy. I thought I was cool, and then all of a sudden, comes through Twitter blue comes in. And it's like you need to pay for your check mark, or it's going away. I was like. Pfft. I am paying for it, so you can you can take your blue check mark and shove it, you know where. And that's exactly what I told Twitter, formerly Twitter, now X. Um, but yeah, so that's that's clearly not not happening. Not to say that it can't happen. Like I know Utah is a team that everyone's kind of looking at. They've got a lot of cap space. They've got a lot of picks and prospects, and you can try and link you know those two teams together. Um, you know, you could probably come up with a trade package that does make a lot of sense, but uh, why would Mitch Marner want to go to Utah? Like we always forget to think about the whole trade and Marner of all people. I, I just don't know if Utah would be his vibe. I don't, I don't get sense the sense that he'd be a, a big fan of Utah where you can't do anything past like nine o'clock at night, apparently. Um, so I, I don't know if that's going to end up coming to fruition. Um, plus there's like the more recent news that it sounds like they're trying to extend them. Like that's kind of the latest, I guess we've heard, unless you listen to Frank Saravalli, Saravalli's digging his heels in that they're, they're, they're going to be trading him at some point, but then other reporting, we're hearing that they're going to trade him. Not that they're going to trade him this week, Mike, they're going to yeah. trade him. Yeah. So we'll, we'll see if this week comes and goes and you know, I, I he'll have to answer to the, the, the reporting that he's making because he's he's digging his heels in that he believes that it's going to happen or they're going to force him into accepting some sort of trade. I don't know. I guess we'll we'll see. But like the latest that we've kind of heard from the other insiders is it sounds like they're kind of leaning towards maybe trying to extend them. Like they might prefer the extension route at some point. And it, it, I kind of started to think about how silent and quiet things have been, especially on the Bertuzzi route, the Domi route, Ilya Labushkin, Edmondson, all of these guys who are pending UFAs, they haven't signed anyone, none of them. And I'm thinking like, is this because they they're trying to extend Marner? And, and, and we've already discussed that, you know, Bertuzzi and Domi probably not coming back. At least, at least all three of them certainly couldn't come back together. I don't believe um, so if neither of those two signed by July one, is that because there's a, 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 a deal ready to be made with Marner by July one that they know that's coming or they're hoping at least by July one that, that, you know, they can get that deal done with. Is that why we haven't seen much movement in these guys? That's what's kind of starting to go around in my head. Like, what do you make of that? I'm, I'm less inclined to think that extensions coming right on July one. I, I think it, I, I mean, in, in based on the, some of the things I was hearing too, is that like he wants to maybe play out the contract and really make the Leafs sweat it. Yeah, I don't, right. I don't see that happen. Like I know that you know the 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 Pierre LeBron was it LeBron who who wrote about it, who spoke with the the agent Darren Ferris. Yeah, I I I just don't like. I think that was a little lip service. Like I feel like Marner and we talked about this on on the episode that we brought it up a few weeks ago. I don't know if he could handle that type of pressure. No, I don't think so either. So I think it's it's a little lip service to say that he wants to finish out the year and play out the year. I think he would probably prefer to have a contract in place. He's willing to play out the year. That might be true, but I think he'd prefer to have a contract in place if if they can come to an agreement. Well, and that's the thing, right? I, I just I don't know where you see everything the least want to get done. Right. And in these de and these upgrades that they want to do, these aren't one year type of things, especially when you go into free agency. Like you're not going to go to a, let's say, a brand and monitor and be like, we want to sign you, but we don't know if we're going to be able to fit you in long term because we also want to do this, this and that. Right. Yeah. Like that, that's the part I'm struggling. Like this year, we know Marner signed. We know what the yes. least have to work with cap wise. 
but it's never been about this year. It's always been about past this. I understand well, that John Tavares contract is off the books. I do get that. But and, and look, I listen to Frank Saravalli, and I think they're part of the reason why he's really pushing this Mitch Marner not sticking around narrative is because at some point, I think he believes that the Leafs want to take some of that money and put it to where they need it, really need it. Right. right. And I, I just think when you're, when you look at how the Panthers, especially the Panthers, like you can't tell me that this team is going to try to bargain. Like I understand the Panthers built their blue line. They didn't really have to spend a lot outside of Aaron Ekblad to ice that blue line. But other teams, if they try to replicate that blue line, they're not going to be able to do that. Like those those guys are not going to come in at. I, I can't. I, I Kevin Papetti had a really good tweet about it. He kind of did a nice breakdown of like what the Panthers blue line costs and like how absurd it was. It, it did not cost the team that much to ice that blue line. But that's not what the NHL is going at this point, especially with the salary cap going up. Salary cap going up means other players see dollar signs and they see hey teams might think i'm worth this but with uh the cap going up a couple more teams might be willing to spend a little bit more well i'm just looking on cap friendly right now for as long as we're still able to look up cap friendly and the maple Leafs yeah, have 18.8 million dollars in cap space like that's enough to work on a blue line that's including mitch yeah. marner's 10.9 million so for this I, like year. as much as for this year, but as much as Frank is saying, oh, they need to take that money. They, they have money. They have that money. Realistically, that a bunch of guys come off the books this year and that they can throw at their back end if they really want and keep Marner. Um, it's just a matter of fact, do they want to keep him long term? And if not, then a trade would be the, I would imagine, preferred route for Toronto if they don't plan on re-signing him. And I'll reiterate this. like To me, there's a clock. I think there is a clock yeah. on a Marner trade, and it's pre-July 1. If there's no trade done at the draft or the days coming after it, like to me, if if he's still a Maple Leaf come July 2nd, let's say, uh, or even July 1st, like by noon, July 1st, I think he's a I think he's a Maple Leaf next year. I really, really do. I think that's the the deal because if you're moving on from him and like Frank Saravalli said, you're making the trade uh, to open up cap space so you can make moves and so you can go and attack the blue line and whatever else you want to do. You know, you, you need to know that on July 1st, you can make those deals. You can't make this yeah. trade on August 13th because all those players are gone now. And you can't, th those those opportunities are no longer there. So I do think there's a clock, you know. So if they are going to trade Mitch Marner, I mean, Frank's there always kind of right where he says, I think it happens by the end of this week. Because if it doesn't, I, I don't see it happening at all either. So whether it does, He's going to be right, but if it doesn't happen this week or this weekend, I don't know if a trade does come. And you're looking, I think, at Mitch Marner returning to the Toronto Maple Leafs, and you know we'll see what happens, whether he ends up signing an extension midsummer like we saw happen with Matthews or signing an extension in the middle of the season like we saw happen with Willie, or maybe he signs at the end of the year, maybe he even walks. I don't know. We'll see how things play out with Mitch Marner. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely going to be something that we'll be keeping our eyes on and talking about all summer long and all season long until – that trade slash extension is put into place. Uh, all right, coming up on the other side, the Hockey Hall of Fame announcement came down today, and we've got some new inductees, and we've also got some snubs, some former Maple Leafs who are probably pissed that once again they were passed up. We'll talk about those guys, and we'll give our draft profile for one of the Leafs picks or the the players we want the Maple Leafs to pick, we're giving up you five draft profiles throughout the week, and we'll take a look at Liam Greentree in a little bit. It's Mike DiStefano with Dave Morissuti. You're listening to the Lockdown Leafs podcast, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network. It's your team every day. Today's show is brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance from superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're to speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered with over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die. You'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with the eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, 
waters, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the price you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit. Only available to U.S. customers. Welcome back into the Locked On At Least podcast. Mike DiStefano and Dave Morissuti with you as we are each and every weekday uh, here on YouTube and wherever you get your podcast from. Uh, if you haven't already and you're enjoying the content and you want to keep track of what's going on with the Maple Leafs all summer long, make sure you are subscribed to the show, whether on uh, YouTube or wherever you get your podcast. Again, five days a week, we got new content coming out to you. Uh, all right. Let's take a look at uh, this year's Hockey Hall of Fame inductees for 2024. Um, We were talking about this right before we got onto the show, that both of us had no idea that the announcement was coming down today. (laughs) Caught me off guard. (laughs) Caught me off. And and maybe it's just because the, the, you know, we were so consumed with what's going on in the cup final that, you know, the day after, you know, we weren't really looking for big news like this, but sure enough, the announcement came through. It's like, Oh wow. I had, no idea this is happening. Um, so six players end up, uh, or six people, however you want to, whatever terminology you want to use, uh, ends up uh, getting inducted into the Hockey Hall of Fame, uh, led by Che Weber, Pavel Datsuk, Jeremy Roenick, Dave Poyle, Colin Campbell, Chrissy Wendell Pohl, and Natalie Darwitz. So that is your class of 2024. Obviously, the three headliners of the class, Shea Weber, Pavel Datsuk, and Jeremy Roenick. Roenick, one of those guys who every year is on like the biggest snubs list, so he finally gets through. Uh, Pavel Datsuk is another guy who was kind of on that snub list for a while. He finally gets through. But Shea Weber, first ballot Hall of Famer, does that surprise you at all? Or did you anticipate Shea Weber? You know, you looked at him when he was playing. You're like, this guy, first ballot Hall of Fame all day long. Oh, yeah. I, I, I thought he was worthy of being a first ballot Hall of Famer. I mean, I was, sure. I, Hall of Famer, I, yes. Yeah. First ballot. I know that's a tough one, uh, but, like, he he's a very accomplished defenseman. I know he didn't win a cup, mm-hmm. but. You look at his resume for, for I mean, he's very close. Yes. Twice. Twice. No, 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 no. He got traded. No, he was not in national because Nashville. he got traded after. Yeah, PK was on that run. Um, But I, I do think when you look at, um, actually, was he on the Knights roster that won the cup in 20? Or is that? 20? No, no, it was a year after. A year after they no. won. So I was I wanted to make that joke. Ah, he came very close there, but no. Um, but th- like, look, internationally, two Olympic gold medals, two world championships. He was a part of the World Cup of Hockey roster, plus a World Junior gold. Like, and not like playing a small part. He was like probably one of Canada's top defensemen. Oh yeah, in those tournaments. Yeah, uh, like incredibly talented. You know that that shot. Is so iconic with him. You know, he played for so long, too. I think, like, longevity was a big one, too. I know at the end of his career, he was dealing with injuries. But he played for so long. He was such a highly touted player. And when I look at the Hall of Fame, I always think of, like, were, were those players among the best at their position? I, I could say that he was definitely among the best at his position. At a time where he had some serious competition. <laughs> you know, when you look at the players he played with, I, I know he didn't win a Norris, but he also was going up at a time where Nick Lidstrom was winning almost every single Norris trophy. Shea Weber didn't win a Norris? No. Wow. Well, I mean, Nick Lidstrom wouldn't have been. I think Duncan Keith would have probably been the the guy who took more, more to him. I think him and Lidstrom only would have been what, like four years they probably overlapped? Not Not a whole lot, but. I think the be- he did win the Marc Messier Award. That was like the one award he did win. Leadership but, Award. Yeah, the best he did. He was a run. So he was a runner up two years in a row in 2011, 2012. Mm. And he was third on the ballot in 14. So like he was close. It's not like he was yeah. like way out of way out of it. I was actually just checking to see who won the Norris that year that he. Did not get it. It was Nicholas Lichtman. <laughs> well, I, mean, I think it was last year then, no? Didn't Lichtman retire in like 2011? 
had to have been. Yeah, I think so. Because I think 2012 might have been. Oh, that was yeah, that was Eric Carlson's first. Yeah. DK. Yeah. He just yeah. could not beat out the Swedish defenseman. That's that. That was his kryptonite. That was it. That was it. The Swedish demon gave him uh, gave him problems, and he never he never won it. That's actually crazy that he never won uh, a Nor. I just probably assume that he would have won at least one Norris. Like being like how good he was uh, yeah. for for so long. Like for a decade, he was. I mean, top five, like consistently a top five defenseman. Like just mm-hmm. yeah bomb of a shot that's what he'll always be known for though heavy heavy shot always won the the hardest shot competition it was like him and Zdeno Chara the, that's what you love to watch for the hardest shot competition was those two when they would go mono a mono so that was a lot of fun uh but yeah so congrats to uh to all of those uh hall of fame recipients I guess they will be um hall of fame inductees at some point uh, I think it's what November is usually when they do. Yeah, uh, usually beginning of November. Yeah, no, have the Hall of Fame game here in Toronto, and it's uh, it's gonna be great. So that'll be a good time. So congrats uh, to them, and we'll we'll reconvene those players in November. But what uh, always comes and stems from the Hall of Fame announcement is the Hall of Fame snub discussion, and there are uh, quite a few guys who got the old snub. Um, Pekka Rene was the first time ballot nominee he he got the snub ryan miller same thing he got the snub kovachuk first ballot guy who got the snub but we always look back on two guys and i remember we did this podcast literally last year and we had the same discussion same conversation how the hell alex mcgillney is not in the hall of fame and still remains to be snubbed year after year after year is criminal absolutely criminal so once again massive snub for for alex mcgillney i'll throw cujo in there as well i I still believe that cujo is a hall of famer and how cujo can't get himself into into the hall of fame is is crazy to me i thought after last year where they let in three goalies that they were going to start kind of playing catch up and get some of these guys in there thought for sure cujo would have had a strong possibility this year no snubbed once again that's our guy cujo mcgillney thought for sure uh these two would would get a real serious look i'm sure they did but snubbed once again what is the hall of fame's issue with alexander mcgillney like cujo they can make the case because of the no cups but i still think that's blasphemous because henrik longfist got in and cujo yeah. shea weber didn't win a cup we, we yeah. just talked about it so so like throw that argument out alexander mcgillney is part of the triple like the triple club he is one at the uh he's won at so many points in his career how is he not in there the guy scored 71 goals in a season yes i know other guys are scoring a lot of goals too but like he was a rookie he was also a trailblazer coming over and leaving russia like when i think of the hockey hall of fame you want to talk about like putting people in it's those who had an impact on the game we had this conversation last year and i can't believe we are having this conversation again and like i was looking at the people who vote on the hall of fame i got part of the selection committee and it's just it's shameful when you look at the players the people that are involved mike gardner brian burke cassie campbell pascal ron francis i think i saw bob Lanny. mckenzie's in there scott morrison what are these people like what Joe Sackick is a part of it too. Like, what are we doing here guys? Yeah. I don't know, man. I, it, it, to me, you look at the hockey hall of fame and, and what it is, it's, it's the story of hockey, right? It's the story of hockey. Can I tell the story without Alex McGillney? And I don't think you can, because without Alex McGillney, I think he, there's, there's a lot in the story that would not be there. He's, he's an early setup character, when it comes to Russians defecting and coming over and playing in North America, does Alex Ovechkin ever get an opportunity to play over here? If McGillney didn't trailblaze and get here, I don't know. Right. Malkin, like Pavel Burrett, like, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. Um, but he definitely was that guy. And it, it, that's one thing, but then to also be like one of the highest scores of all time and still not get nominated, is yeah. outrageous, absolutely outrageous. Like he's got what over five hundred goals, doesn't he, McGillney? Yes. Like, 
there's only a handful of guys who are in that stratosphere. And for him, right, he to, has four, 473 goals. Okay. So he was close. And how many games? Like in 990 games. He, has so he didn't even, goals. he didn't even, didn't even get to a thousand games. Like typically, if you look at guys who have 500 goals, they're all sitting there at 12, 13, 1400 games. Like yeah. goals per game, I bet you he's up in the top. So it, it, disgrace. I, I, every year we're going to have the same conversation until he finally gets but, in. And it kind of brings up another thing we want to talk about today. But what I hate about the Hall of Hockey Hall of Fame selection, too, unlike baseball, where they release the, the votes and how many votes guys got and who missed the cut by how much, the mm-hmm. Hockey Hall of Fame does not share those votes. Yeah. But you know what votes we do get? Are the Con Smythe votes. Yeah, why don't we take a peek at the Con Smythe votes? Because there, there was one specific voter that had an interesting ballot that I think we need to call him out on. Highlight Jim Matheson for me, please. <laughs> Jim Matheson of Post Media. McDavid Hyman Bouchard. Jim, they didn't win. How could you possibly have your entire list be Edmonton Oilers? It's outrageous. Outrageous. He's the only guy, I think, who even had two Oilers. No. No. Daniel Daniel Nugent Brown, Brown, who covers the Oilers for the Athletic, had two Oilers as well. Yeah. Also, Mark Spector, who also covers the Oilers, had Stu Skinner. I mean, I guess he has Skinner there. At least Skinner played a a pretty decent role. And he's Uh, not the only one. Bouchard had like 30 something points and and like broke records. So I I don't mind Bouchard. But like the fact that you had Hyman, like, I I don't know. Like, they all had great playoff. Don't get me wrong. But like, just to not have Barkov or Bobrovsky in there is outrageous. Like, absolutely (laughs) insane. And McDavid was basically unanimous. Only one person, Ryan Clark from ESPN, had Bobrovsky one and then had McDavid second and Barkov third. Outside of that, McDavid was was unanimous to uh yeah, to get I'm the very surprised. I was surprised about that, I will say. Like that I know Bobrovsky played well in game seven, but yeah, um, usually, I, usually yeah, I, it, it was pretty it, much a lock. Going into yeah, the game, yeah, a conversation that a lot of these guys have together. Like, yeah, we're doing McDavid probably, right? Yeah, okay. But like Ryan, just like, nope. He must have been like me and had a had a bet on Bobrovsky in some way, shape, or form. <laughs> There's always cool. one guy though, right? There's always one guy, always someone yeah. who screws the pooch for uh, for everyone else. What did you make of everybody, by the way, getting on McDavid's ass today about not being out there for ridiculous? Like, the dude just lost the biggest game of his career. He's like, it was like 10 minutes after the game had went. He's definitely not in his gear anymore. He's mourning with his team that just lost, you know, their big game. He's like, the captain of the team. He's probably talking like, to the guys in the dressing room. And people are like, oh, bad luck that he didn't come out. Like, the, the guy was literally probably in the shower <laughs> by the time they got to it. Like, you're no, worried. Not, not no, out? no, not even that. Bad look. It would have been a worse look having your Conn Smythe winner going and get his trophy while being booed, booed by yeah. the whole crowd. You think that would have been the most uncomfortable situation ever to watch the Con- McDavid going at that trophy and being booed for it? Like, yeah. you know what? Get off your high horse. It was the Panthers' victory. He did. He did not want to have. Like, I would not want to be out there. Watching well, these guys all celebrate, and you have to go and pick up an individual award yeah. when your team just suffered one of the tough, as you said, the toughest loss of their careers. Yeah, to be honest, you can make the argument that was that was very selfless of McDavid to forego, you know, that going and, and grabbing that trophy and and igno- being acknowledged, allowing himself to get acknowledged for the amazing playoff he had. He said, "No, nah, I I don't care. I didn't win the Stanley Cup. I let my team down." I'm not, I don't, uh, there's nothing for me to celebrate. So I, I actually appreciate yeah. what he did. And I don't know, man. I, 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 didn't, even, I didn't even expect him to stay out there personally. I, I didn't expect him to go and get that trophy. No, of course not, which he didn't. But, you know, I, I also think the NHL did right by acknowledging live on TV. Like, yeah. I heard some people being like, well, then they should have given it to him, you know, in the back or just not done it. It's no, like, well, that's not how you do it. Guys. What? No, you still have to do the presentation. I think the way that the it went down. The best presentation of all the sports, by the way. 
Yeah, like the 100% it is. The, the cup, oh, I, I could watch it for days. Um, the cup, just everyone raising it. Paul Maurice raising it. Uh, Luongo, Kalak Pozo, go down the list. But yeah, I, I had no problems. I thought the NHL did right by, you know, acknowledging McDavid won. You know, we all know this. Yep. Okay. Everyone booed it, whatever. McDavid did not come out. I have no problem with that either. And then they quickly moved the con smite out of the way, brought in Lord Stanley, and they continued on with the festivities. I had no problem with how that went. I just saw so many people complaining about it on Twitter. I thought it was ridiculous. And uh, I don't know. I didn't I didn't have a problem with any of it. All right. On the other side, let's look do our deep dive into our draft profile for the day. We'll take a look at Liam Greentree, a possible Leafs draft target. We'll do that next. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Game Time is an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, which makes getting tickets faster and easier. Prices on the Game Time app actually go down the closer it gets to first pitch. With killer last minute deals, all in prices, views from receipt, and the lowest price guarantee, Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying tickets. They've got last minute deals where you can save up to 60% off buying last minute for sports, comedy, theater, concerts, whatever you're going to. They've got flash deals, zone deals, and the lowest price guarantee or game time will credit you 110% of the difference. Take the guesswork out of buying MLB tickets with game time. Download the game time app, create an account, use the code locked on NHL for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply again, create an account, redeem the code locked on NHL for $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. The Lockdown Lease podcast continues with Mike DiStefano and Dave Morissuti here on a Wednesday, just two days out from the NHL draft round one taking place in Las Vegas at the Sphere, which may not be the final decentralized draft. I don't know if you kind of saw that report popping around the other day. Yeah, I was listening to the Chris Johnston show, uh, and he was saying there's some rumblings that it may not be the last decentralized draft like there it, it could make a comeback at some point we're having everybody in the building which i i prefer because i i love the fact that uh everyone gets in these buildings i think it creates a, a good ambience for for good theater um but anyways the maple leafs are on the clock at pick number 23 and all week long we've been looking at uh one prospect a day, kind of the five prospects that we would like the Maple Leafs to select. So let's call them their draft targets uh, for us here. We've already taken a look at a couple of defensemen in Stian Solberg. We took a look at EJ Emery. And here's the first forward that we're taking a look at, doing a little draft profile of, and it's Liam Greentree. Liam, Gr Liam Greentree, left shot forward who plays on the right side, a winger, big body, six foot two, 215 pounds. He's the captain of the Windsor Spitfires had a great season this year 36 goals 54 assists for 90 points um, big time goal scorer elite prospects I'll give you their little rundown uh, that they had in the draft guide a uh, little prospect um, profile it was Green Tree navigates his way around opponents with a series of lookoffs, give and goes, a sophisticated delay game that allows him to problem solve his way around numbers uh, off the rush. He's consistently scanning, registering his options, uh, at the obstacles that would keep him from getting them the puck. So, you know, big time playmaking, dra uh, uh, play driving. Uh, scoring threat off the wing. So uh, Liam Greentree, I think, would be a, a good prospect. The skating is a little bit uh, a below average, which is, I think, the big knock on Liam Greentree. But good size, good skill. Uh, I think that he would be a, a, a solid pick for the Maple Leafs if he's there at 23. Yeah, I was reading, um, again, I was reading Jason Bukla, who said, like, for a guy who puts up the offense, he's also not a guy who cuts corners defensively, which you like to hear that. It seems to be like one of those uh, players that would complement, like, you know, some of the teammates who don't exactly have the size. So he'd be like the, I wouldn't say the Matthew Nyes, but maybe there's a bit of that to him where he's the guy that's going to go out there and be the physical, defensively responsible, while also capable of playing that power game, which. Mm -hmm. We know the Leafs really like. Yes. Yes. 
we do know that that's what they're trying to get incorporated into uh, into this team. So, you know, he does check some of the boxes. Uh, why don't we hear from uh, from our locked on NHL prospects host who did a little bit of a, a quick one minute scouting report, a little breakdown on Liam Greentree. So why don't we play that uh, for for the listeners and viewers? Liam Greentree is an excellent prospect for the 2024 NHL draft, but what's keeping him outside the top 10? I'm Hattie Kalikesh from Locked On NHL Prospects, ready to give you the breakdown. Greentree is a 6'2", 200-pound right-shot winger who played for the Windsor Spitfires in the OHL. He captained his team as an 18-year-old and led them by 24 points in scoring with his 90 points in 64 games, including 36 goals. Greentree is a great shooter with amazing hands. He can dice through defenses really well with his amazing reads of the game, and his hockey sense just got better and better as the year went on. He unlocked the play making side of his game that wasn't there and he really showed how complete of a player he is with his good defensive reads and positioning his skating though is a big reason is outside the top 10 it really limits how much effort he can put into every shift but if he lands in the right team they could turn him into the next tyler to foley for more on green tree and all things nhl draft follow and subscribe to locked on nhl prospects on youtube or wherever you get your podcasts all right, so appreciate that. There's some Heidi Kalakesh. You can listen to him uh, every day over on the Locked On NHL Prospect Show, and right now would be a perfect time to go and check out uh, the show, obviously with the draft coming up in just a couple of days. Um, but he noted it. like The thing that's keeping Green Tree away from the top 10 and being a top half of the first round pick is, you know, the skating, you know, the, and, and in the NHL in today's league, skating is, is, legitimately a must at this point you have to be able to skate you can't just be big and physical anymore you got to be able to skate and keep up with the the pace and the speed of the modern nhl um i'm just taking a look at where he is ranked on most uh draft boards and you know you pretty much see him in the mid teens to early 20s on most boards, you were talking about Bukla of sports. Then he's got him ranked as the number 17 prospect. Uh, looks like daily Faceoff has him as the number 19 prospect. You've got uh, our boy, Tony Ferrari, big fan of him as the number 16 prospect. They've got Craig button who has him at number 23 and Bob McKenzie at number 17. So the consolidated rankings has him as the number 16 prospect on average. So, I mean, he's, he's, he's a good player. We'll see if he can last to pick number 23, but if potentially people look at the skating and he starts to drop a little bit, the Leafs have had some success when it comes to cultivating talent who haven't been great skaters. They've got, you know, Barb Underhill, one of the best skating coaches in the league. Um, and, and she's been able to help, uh, you know, a lot of players kind of find their stride pun intended. And maybe they feel they could do the same with green tree if he falls to them. Yeah. And I, I think I actually just looked uh, Bob McKenzie's updated rankings has him as 18. They just went with down one spot. We're getting a little, a little closer, closer. Little closer, closer to the least. Um, but yeah, I again, I I think yeah, it's which 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 Bob McKenzie. Keep in mind, one of the, like go right, Bobby Max the go. If he's dropped from seventeen to eighteen, he's got scouts and sources telling him he's yeah. likely dropping in this draft which yeah. is a good thing if you're hoping to get him at 23 if you're the Maple Leafs. Yeah, Bob's got one of the, like he's he's got his list comes out every year and it's like it's Bang a state. It's, it's like it's pretty close. 20 29 of his top 32 will go in the first round. Guaranteed. Yeah. So, and and look, I what I like about Green Tree as again is also this team has prioritized skill a lot and I, I think Green Tree has the skill but we've also seen a, that that lack of size is starting to show when you look at the prospects coming up and what the Leafs have. There's not a whole lot of size. And yeah. if you look at the way these playoffs were played, you need some size. You need to be able to compete with these bigger teams, especially the, the Floridas that are just... And like you look at the Division Two in, in the Atlantic, you need bigger. You need to get bigger. That's how you're going to yeah. have to win in this Atlanta division. You need to add some size. And look, people people hate hate hearing this, but like this draft is considered a bit of a weaker draft. Um, so if you're picking at 23 in a weak draft, you're probably not picking a guy who's projected to be a top line player, like borderline top six player. Like you're looking at a guy who, you know, is more of a middle six guy, if not like a you know a bottom six player. 
potentially, you know, as a power forward, good smooth skating winger, like, or not skate, sorry, power forward, um, skilled winger, not smooth skating, <laughs> obviously. Um, and that might be what he, what he becomes. And in a draft like this, you know, that's, that's okay. Right. You've got enough tools. You like the, the tool bag that is there with the skill and with, with, with the size, and you hope you can just upgrade the skating a little bit and uh, then maybe, you know, he can grow into something a little better, but we'll see. But that's uh, that's today's draft breakdown of Liam Greentree. So it's three we've done. We'll do another one tomorrow. And then our final draft profile will do on Friday, the morning of the NHL entry draft. That will do it for us here today on the podcast. I'd like to thank you all for listening and supporting the show. You can subscribe to the Locked On Leafs podcast on all podcast platforms and receive daily Leafs content. Follow myself on X at Mickey underscore Canuck. Follow Dave at D underscore Morissuti and follow the show as well at Locked On Leafs. Go ahead and uh, leave a like and a comment down below if you enjoyed the video. We'll be back for another episode for you guys tomorrow. But until then, keep locked right here on Locked On Leafs.